Hello everyone, this is the International Master of Givon here. Today we're going to discuss one of the most beautiful chess games ever played. A game which was played in the year 1999 by two players that I hope uh, do not need any big introduction. With the white pieces we have the reigning world champion at the time, uh, Garry Kasparov. With the black pieces we have uh, Vassil and Topalov, also extremely strong chess player back in the day but which is also active um, these days. So what is unique about uh, this game, to me at least, is uh, the fact that uh, a lot of this game really saw uh, a lot of unique and extremely beautiful sacrifices and a very beautiful attack that Kasparov managed to uh, execute in this game uh, but for many people who watch this game they might assume that Kasparov just calculated you know everything to the end and just just realized that he's going to checkmate but this is not true I think not at least not necessarily I think that this game and you will see a couple of specific moments in this game that might also indicate that shows that great players and I think especially a player like Kaspar, a very aggressive and dynamic player uh, many times we will see them playing moves out of pure uh, intuition and feeling and which based on their experience and knowledge and what is beautiful that in many moments in this game Kasparov made such strong moves that even for today's chess engines which are considerably stronger than any human chess players even for these um, uh, engines the moves that some of the moves that Kasparov made in this game are not obvious and it even takes for the engine sometimes to realize um, that these moves were were the, maybe the strongest and it takes even in some moments um, if you if you look through this game th through an engine it's actually a very fun experience because you might encounter positions where the engines might say just a big advantage to black but after after a couple of seconds or minutes suddenly it completely changes his mind and say that white is completely winning so a really fun experience so also a little bit of background this is the year 1999 um, Topalov playing the black pieces and according to my research in the year uh, 1998 Kasparov and Topalov played eight eight times in tournament games in different time controls but the score between them um, was something like um, four wins for Kasparov, one win for Topolov, and the rest were draws. And going through these games, I've noticed that many games Kasparov won because of very good preparation in the opening. So in this game, I think already in the first move, after e4, Topolov decided to slightly surprise his very well prepared opponent. I think at these days, Kasparov really had a reputation of a crazy good uh, opening preparation. Many people were pretty much intimidated by this. So instead of being uh, kind of faithful to his normal Sicilian defense that he usually implements, Topalov played this move d6, which is um, kind of an invitation to go into a perk defense, much less popular opening, uh, especially in the top level. But I think um, this was perhaps uh, an interesting choice just to get Kasparov out of his pre preparation and perhaps playing a slightly more uh, original game where both players had to think on their own. And this actually was also very good for the viewers because we are about to encounter uh, such a great game. So Kasparov played d4, seizing the center, knight f6, knight c3. We have uh, pretty standard stuff here. Black is now playing the characteristic move for this opening g6. So his intention is to fan shadow the bishop on g7. I think this opening was also 
fairly comfortable for Topalov to play because um, he is also a King's Indian player and so in the Prague defense and in the King's Indian the pawn structure looks pretty much the same with black putting a pawn on d6 and striving to fianchetto his bishop on g7 so it, it definitely uh, felt home here even though it is not exactly his opening and Kasparov uh, chooses here one of the most aggressive setups that uh, the white players can choose here which is to play the move bishop e3 with the intention of playing queen d2 and long castle and playing a position of opposite side castlings very very understandable choice of Kasparov very aggressive player he wants to go for a sharp game Topolov now plays the move bishop g7 I will not deal too much with opening subtleties here for example some opening experts in the prick defense suggest that it's wiser to start with the move c6 with some subtle points about um, white uh, wanting at some point to play the move queen d2 and bishop h6 so black might want to actually capture the bishop on h6 in one tempo in comparison for example the game position where he had to do this in two tempos because the bishop has already gone to g7 this uh, i think at this stage though uh, the players are not really um, perhaps being paying too much attention to such subtle details so bishop g7 was played, queen to d2, c6. In these variations, black is not really uh, in, um, in any hurry to castle because if it does castle, it kind of gives white a very uh, kind of obvious target to attack. The king on the king side, he would start perhaps pushing his pawns forward on the king side and he maybe prefers to be slightly more flexible. So white plays the move f3, preparing for some future attacks on the king side with g4 and h4. And black plays b5, he already thinks about his own counterplay on the queen side, which is a very understandable move. And now in this and in the next couple of moves, both players are trying to be kind of clever about their castling. Nobody is really revealing... Um, Nobody's really revealing uh, on which side uh, they want to castle. Uh, if you want to uh, gain some more um, knowledge about how to choose the uh, the right side to castle in a chess game, uh, you can watch uh, the video I did about uh, this topic on this channel. Um, so Kasparov chooses to play this this kind of flexible move knight to e2 because he thinks that if he castles long immediately once again it gives black this kind of slightly uh, easier times to create his own counterplay on the queen side for example black can play a move like queen a5 threatening to go b4 dislodging the knight from c3 following by capturing on a2 so he tries to be just flexible and develop his pieces Black is doing exactly the same thing, he is not committing his king to short castling but rather waits for a couple of moves to see exactly what white is doing. He plays the move knight to d7, perhaps preparing some maneuvers towards the queen side of the board where black's counterplay should come from. And white plays his move bishop h6, very a natural exchange, the bishop on g7 of black's is a very active bishop exchanging it serves white intentions pretty well black now takes on h6 queen takes h6 at this point it it um, it was pretty obvious that black is not going to castle short in this game and his intentions are to castle on the other side so he plays the natural move bishop to b7 developing a piece now white plays this kind of clever move pawn to a3 this is a small preparation for the move short castles as if white plays this move immediately once again this move queen a5 comes with a very unpleasant threat of b4 and there are actually serious problems to protect the pawn on a2 for white so a little prophylactic move there from Kasparov so now um, black is 
once again making a very natural move, striking in the center of the board. You might see that notice that at this point, white is controlling the center pretty much. Um, the white center is pretty much uncontested, so black tries to place his own pawn in the center, fighting basically for his ground. And basically now white is ready to castle, he does so. Also kind of eyeballing black's queen along the d-file, so top, top of really uh, Harris to let his queen uh, bring his queen out of this file. So queen e7 was played, also preparing long castles. Now white plays this, once again, prophylactic move. You might notice that this position is quite static. Nothing really uh, very dramatic is going on on the board. Both players are kind, kind of allowing themselves to play slightly slow moves, which slightly improve their position. So for example, here Kasparov plays this move king b1. This is a universally useful move for white, getting the king out of any potential checks along this file or this diagonal or this file that might get opened up in the future. This is a kind of a move that sometimes players um, play even automatically in some Sicilian variations just to get the king safe. Once again, um, Topalov playing a move, once again also in a similar fashion, a6, just slightly defending his pawn on b5, which is a little bit weak, perhaps thinking in the future about pushing his pawn to c5 and releasing that basically caged bishop on b7, which is at the moment pretty much um, passive. Now white's a move, and I want to ask the viewers, so you're about to reach the middle game, still not all of your pieces are developed. How would you increase white's pressure over black's position? And also along the way you'll, we also need to think about development. So which plan white chose in this position? You can stop the video and think about it a little bit. So Kasparov chose um, a very nice plan. He just intuitively felt that black's queen side is slightly exposed, so he chose to play this very nice move knight to c1 with the idea to maneuver the knight all the way to this weakened square on a5, which could be a very nice anchor square for this knight. But also this move perhaps helping this bishop to get into the game later on, so a multi-purpose move there from Kasparov. Very good. Black castle is long. It doesn't really have all that much options. White now played knight to b3, continuing his plan. At this point in the game, I think Topalov just realized that if he's going to just sit and do nothing, Kasparov will inevitably develop his attack to be very strong. So he decided, he decides actually to create some complications and open up the center very aggressively. He now takes on d4 and after rook takes d4 he's, he's going for c5. This is a kind of a double-edged strategy because on one side black is activating his bishop and also is slightly improving uh, his structure on the queen side of his pawns but at the same time you see that with each pawn moving in front of his king he slightly weakens his king position and this is in a chess game um, something that many times chess players, a decision that the chess player many times needs to choose is uh, to kind of, he needs to evaluate what is more important in the position, the activity of his pieces or the safety of his king. In this game Topolov um, chooses the activity which is a very understandable decision. And after rook d1 Black plays knight to b6, once again a very understandable move, getting the knight into slightly more active square and even thinking about a counterplay with the move pawn to d5. Now it is one more important moment in this game, it is white to move and I once again want to ask the viewers to find a way to improve white's position. So uh, the knight on b3 is already kind of well placed, ready to jump to g5. 
think about which pieces of white are still not developed into the game and let's find good squares for them. So Kasparov plays, <coughs> I'm sorry, Kasparov played a very nice move, pawn to g3, because he realizes the bishop doesn't have a lot of future on this diagonal because these two pawns really block the vision for him. So he decides to maneuver his bishop to this diagonal, which is actually, a, will have much more purpose there. And after the move king to b8, um, the bishop is now ready to go to h3, but Kasparov um, played this kind of intermediate move here. He played knight a5 first. Some critics claimed after the game that this move was perhaps slightly inaccurate, but once again, um, I, I'm not going uh, to be uh, uh, dealing with the uh, very, very subtle differences between all of White's moves here, just to make this video on a kind of not make it too long. Basically, this move is very natural. Black now plays bishop to a8 to safeguard his bishop. White continues his plan with bishop h3. And I want you to remember this bishop on h3 is actually going to play a very important role in White's eventual attack. For the moment, he's covering a lot of important squares in the black's camp. For example, he is not allowing the black king to escape to c8 if he ever gets under attack. He is not allowing the square on d7 uh, too easily for the black pieces. He is contributing quite a lot to white's attack. Black now, once again, understood that he cannot just sit and wait for white to execute his plans. He played the move d5, counter-attacking in the center. Kasparov checked on f4, bringing his queen closer to the attack, because until that point uh, the queen had already no purpose on h6, since the black king castled on the other side. And after king to a7, Kasparov brings his last pieces into the game, rook h to e1, fully centralizing white rooks. Now black plays the move pawn to d4 hitting the knight on c3. So, where do you think the knight should retreat to? And remember that um, this position, it, there is a very big fight on the board for the initiative. Nobody really wants to lose any ground and to move his pieces into passive positions. So, for example, uh, moves like knight e2 or knight a2 do not really, come, do not really inspire us is very active. So Kasparov basically played the only move which makes sense in this position in terms of developing his attack, which is knight to d5, going only to the center of the board, opening up lines for his pieces, and now the rook on e1 starts to be active. Black took this knight on d5, he cannot really um, stand the, the activity of this knight, knight takes d5, pawn takes d5, and queen d6, the only move, because the queen still has to protect this knight on f6. And starting from this point, we are about to kind of go very... Um, we are about to go into the very sharp complications that arise, that are kind of... that are that, that happen in the game. Um, I want to mention that if Kasparov would not play the move that he actually played in the game, and just go for an end game, for example, like an obvious move like queen takes d6. If anything, in this position, black is probably doing better because without the queens, now the black king is completely safe. And actually, the pawn on d5 is very likely to fall either now or in the next couple of moves. So, this was definitely not Kasparov's intention to go for the end game. He understood that he must keep his, his initiative alive and he sat here for a very long time calculating a lot of variations. Once again, in my opinion, he, he did not realize at this point exactly what is going on. Uh, but he felt that he must have a strong attack here because all of his pieces are well placed. The knight on a5 is well placed for the attack. Both of his rooks are centralized and also this bishop 
as we mentioned, is doing quite an important job of controlling important squares along this diagonal. And he decided to go what I consider to be an intuitive sacrifice. Rook takes d4. Uh, pretty much a beautiful move in itself, but this move is only being justified by the next move. Now, in the actual game, Topalov just accepted the sacrifice, probably just kind of not believing that Kasparov can sacrifice so much material without uh, having a very forced way to checkmate, and he probably believed um, that he, he might be able to hold because he will have a lot of material in, at his disposal. Once again, some later, after the game, a lot of analyzes have been made, a lot of ways for black to fight back in this position have been found. I will mention a few. Uh, some very cold-blooded moves. For example, one move that um, almost no source have been recommending and I don't think also many player would be able to find, including myself, is a very cold-blooded move G5 <laughs> with a very subtle point that if white, for example, just takes the spawn, now black can take the rook on d4 without the queen ever being able to take on d4. This is just one option that might give black some hope. Another option that some sources have recommended is the move king to b6, which is perhaps even a more cold-blooded move, just attacking uh, the white knight on a5, keeping all of the tension in the position. I believe this is an extremely difficult move to make in a practical game. So let's just go with the game uh, moves because this is eventually what we want to see, the beauty of white's attack. Pawn takes d4. And now maybe for a lot of people it would be, they might assume that after this move it is pretty much automatic just to uh, just to take on d4. Um, but now actually black can block with his queen on b6 and it will be much more difficult for white uh, to continue his attack and perhaps black is just winning because the moment white is running out uh, of fuel in his attack he will be just left with too much material down. So the really beautiful point about white sacrifice is this extremely subtle move, rook to e7 check. Basically a double rook sacrifice. Now the second rook already cannot be accepted because after queen takes e7, queen takes d4. The difference is that now black does not have this move queen to b6, which means that the only legal move is king to b8. And now after queen b6 check, black is just losing on the spot. By the way, notice how important is this bishop on a3 as I mentioned earlier. For example, bishop to b7, knight to 6 check, and black is getting checkmated on the next move. So black now played his only move, king to b6, and he's about to go for a very long walk with his king. Queen takes d4 check, king takes a5, this is a forcing move. So at the moment, black is a rook and a piece up, but his king is reaching all the way to a4, an extremely uncommon square for a king to be on. So I think that in his head Kasparov sac um, kind of calculated all the way to this position when he initially sacrificed his first rook and I think he didn't really see a way to checkmate black by, a f by forcing means but he just felt that something must be found here. So in this position Kasparov played the move which I believe is extremely natural. He played the move queen to c3 just threatening checkmate on b3. After the game, after a lot of analysis, once again we are talking about times where people d did not have yet such strong engines as we had today, they had to figure everything themselves. They came to realize that the move rook to a7 was stronger. Once again, an extremely subtle move. The idea is that now white is not only uh, the, does not only want to checkmate on this angle, he is also creating ideas to checkmate 
from this angle because this king on a4 is extremely problematically placed and can be very easily checkmated uh, in theory why just need to have basically the right uh, resources for this um, I won't go very deep into this one uh, because later on I will show I mean if I will just show every possible variation that might appear in this game this video will be basically endless I will just try to focus on the most important variations in this game so Queen c3 threatening uh, to checkmate black on uh, on b3 basically at this point um, I think that uh, Topalo realized that he's in a big danger but at this point um, there is no way back probably so he took the pawn on d5 with his queen just to illustrate one very beautiful checkmate that might appear if black would take on d5 with his bishop uh, white could checkmate here with an extremely beautiful move just king b2 and the threat is just to go queen to b3 check so i will just make a random move just just for us to see such a unique checkmate on the board and how often do you see such a checkmate probably almost practically almost never and we will see actually this motif also perhaps in some future variations so white's attack as i as i've mentioned is basically based on two uh, motifs the checkmate idea the checkmating ideas on a6 or the checkmating ideas on b3 so basically what white is going to do on his next move is to combine both of these ideas to eventually checkmate uh, black so queen takes d5 Rook a7, threatening checkmate on a6. The only way for black to defend is bishop to b7. And now white uses the fact that the black queen must constantly guard this square on b3 in order to uh, take this bishop on b7. I will just quickly mention that if white is just playing king b2 like we have seen uh, previously, threatening the, the same checkmate, now it's not working because black can just exchange queens with queen d4 this would not work so white is taking on b7 uh, restoring some material so now black is kind of only having uh, a rook up but white is still having an extremely strong attack at his disposal so at this point um, black played the move queen to c4 very natural move trying to exchange queens and basically with the exchange of queens black is hoping for white's attack to disappear and um, i want to show you one extremely additional extremely beautiful additional variation uh, some later sources claim that the move rook h to e8 was a better defensive strategy just to bring uh, just more peace into the defense now white must play the move rook to b6 what white must constantly create threats of checkmate obviously because otherwise he would be just left with no material so this is the threat black at this point is forced to play rook to a8 to defend the pawn on a6 and now look at this beautiful move bishop to f1 which is only being found after the game this is maybe one of the most subtle moves uh, throughout the variations i've encountered in this game in order to understand the point of this move, let us see uh, what happens if white tries to play the move rook to d6. So the point is that black cannot take the rook because of the checkmate on b3. But unfortunately for white, black can just play queen to c4 and keep the long diagonal and the guard and still guards the square on b3. This is why uh, this is why the move bishop f1 is coming with the sole purpose of protecting the, the square uh, on c4 in preparation of the move rook to d6 and actually black is um, completely helpless here white is just threatening rook d6 uh, winning extremely beautiful black is full rook up and it's his move and he cannot do anything he played the queen c4 very understandable move now white grabbed the knight on f6 so keeping the queens on the board restoring some material and also very importantly 
threatening queen takes a6 checkmate. Once again, as we mentioned, it is extremely important for black and uh, for white to constantly create threats and not to allow white any uh, time and uh, not allow black any time to consolidate himself. At this point, black had a chance to exchange queens. Many people uh, ask themselves after the game why Topalov at this point did not just play rook d1 check, king to b2, and now queen d4 uh, check, um, forcing the exchange of queens. And after queen takes d4, rook takes d4, this position does not, might not seem so bad for black because he is having still a material, summit material advantage. But very soon we realize that after the move rook takes f7, not only that white has two pawns and a bishop for a rook, which, is, which means that black does not really have uh, any material advantage, white is now threatening to play bishop e6 and bishop e3 checkmate. So even without the queens on the, uh, uh, on the board, uh, black's troubles with his king uh, still continue. White is winning in this position. So uh, black tried his best with king takes a3, queen takes a6 check, and king takes b4. We see that uh, black's, um, black actually also have his own attack. If white loses even a single move, he will be checkmated himself. So this move that with every move, white must carry a very big threat and must do everything extremely forcefully. So this is white's move in this position. What would you play as white? And keep in mind that you have to do everything, if possible, with a gain of checks. White doesn't actually have a whole lot of checks in this position. So basically he must play c3 check, keeping the same, uh, the same logic um, of uh, forcing moves. Black cannot take with the queen because then uh, after queen takes b5 he will be checkmated extremely quickly. He was forced to play king takes um, c3. Now thanks to this little sacrifice of the pawn white is now granted one more check on a1. We see that the black king is going for a very long walk. He is still having the material advantage, but white is constantly, const is constantly creating threats and checks, so he cannot really arrange any proper defense. Black played king to d2. If he chooses to go back on b4, then he will be just um, chased by the white queen uh, into a5, after which queen a3 check, queen a4 is forced, and rook a7. The game would not end in a checkmate, but white will win the black queen, which is good enough for him to claim the victory. So black played king to d2, queen b2 check, and um, king d1. So you can see that uh, the black king basically went all the way from, from e8 to d1 in this game. Quite a remarkable uh, achievement for white. But it's not still not obvious how exactly to win as white because there are no um, kind of very good ways to check here the black king. And now Kasparov being a great chess player uses all of his resources, realizes that the only piece that still did not contribute too much uh, to white's attack is this bishop on a3. The original purpose of this bishop was to guard some key squares on this diagonal, but since the king is long gone from these squares, he now finds an extremely beautiful move, bishop to f1. Not only attacking the black queen, but also disturbing the queen from creating any counter checks against the white king, with the tactical idea that if this bishop is being captured, then we have queen c2 check, king e1 and rook e7, with checkmate to follow on the next move. And this was pretty much the move which sealed the fate of Black's, um, of the Black King in this game. Topol played, uh, tried his best chance to go rook d2, trying to exchange the queens, but Kasparov had 
no such intentions. He now played basically the last precise move of this game, which was rook to d7, basically deflecting the black rook from attacking the white queen. Black was forced to take this rook, and now white can safely capture uh, the black queen. Uh, and luckily for white, after b takes c4, at this point white only have a queen for two rooks and a pawn, but very conveniently for him, also the black rook on h8 was uh, hanging, so he just grabbed it and went on to win in a couple of moves thanks to his huge material advantage. So, I uh, really hope you enjoyed this game, one of the really, the holy grails of, uh, of, uh, of Kasparov and his uh, chess imagination. Um, let me know uh, in the comments if you have any, any thoughts on the game or any more variations you wanted uh, to check. And uh, yeah, don't forget to follow uh, uh, the blog um which is uh, that will be created specifically for this game and you can follow it there on the link below so thank you all guys for watching and i'll see you in the next videos see you guys bye bye